today. I'm here representing her campus. I'm also representing the uh, festival M3F. So really excited to get to chat with you, um, hear more about you, learn more about you. Yeah, so I guess we can get into it then. So tell me about yourself. Um, I know your name is Holden, but um, tell me about your origin story. I really want to know where the name Del Water Gap came from because I, I love it. And I also feel like uh, the first time I saw it on like the Spotify like charts, I was like, that is a name that I will feel like I will remember. I love to hear that. Yeah, I, it's, uh, it's funny. I've, I've been using it for so long. I have lost sight of it a bit, you know? Yeah. Like seeing your own face in the mirror. You're like, yeah, that's a face. So hearing you say that it's interesting is awesome. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, I was in. I was playing. I when I was a teenager, I was playing drums in a in a noise rock band in uh, New Jersey, and I had started writing songs, and I really wanted to sing the songs. They wouldn't really let me because I was the drummer. So I <laughs> I a bit vindictively decided to make a list of band names for my own project amazing so my own. there's a park in new jersey in pennsylvania called the delaware water gap and i saw that written somewhere in sharpie and i thought that's a really cool name and i didn't know what it meant at the time but it ended up on my list of my vindictive list of band names and it ended up just floating to the top so I, I ended up writing and recording some songs when I was finishing up high school and um, putting them out under the name Del Water Gap and and since then I've it's 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 been the name that I use for music. Follow-up question do you ever feel like you have an identity crisis with the name Holden because you're so attached to like Del Water Gap now? Yeah I mean it's gotten simpler over the years because Del Water Gap used to be a band so it yeah. was something I shared with a few people. Um, it became a solo project about three years ago, four years ago about. So um, it's been easier. I think I think it's it's honestly just a bit of a problem practically because I find that artists that use a name that they can introduce themselves as, yeah. um, they just have an easier time connecting themselves to their artist project, you know? So I don't introduce myself as Dell, but- <laughs> That would like, be funny. Uh, Shorten it up. Uh, Hey, Del. Hey, what's up? I'm Del. But I, I never, I always, you know, introduce myself as Holden. And then if it comes up, I'll say, you know, I have this project, Del Water Gap. But it's, um, I don't know, there, there's there's good parts about that too, right? Like getting to separate. Yeah. But like, I have some friends who use their their given names as their artist names. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like a different, different thing. Yeah. Okay. Back, back, I guess, to origin story and you. Um, you actually started off your very first headline tour at Shuba's in Chicago. And I live in Chicago and I live right next to Shuba's. So how does that feel like starting your very first headline tour versus now being, you know, a few years down the road and working with Maggie Rogers, who you have such like a strong history with, um, and then playing an out, like a sold out show, might I say, at Argon Ballroom, which is one of the most iconic Chicago venues in my mind. It's beautiful. It's my favorite venue ever. Um, how does that feel? Just the kind of mind shift of playing that like really small, like intimate venue and then moving to that huge venue that's sold out um, with one of your favorite people. Yeah, I mean, I think these types of conversations and those types of questions are a really good moment to check in. I think when life is changing really quickly, it is really easy to miss it and forget where you started, um, especially on tour. And tour is, <clears throat> you know, you live in this reality that is running alongside normal reality. You know, you're sleeping 3 a.m. to 2 p.m. You know, you're driving a lot, you're eating, weird food you're doing laundry at weird hours everything is feels really removed from the world and so your sense of time gets very warped and that is something that has caused me uh quite a bit of distress on tour in the past especially long tours my mental health has gotten a little bit itchy and going into this tour, one of the things my therapist suggested is that I have a gratitude practice, like a really active gratitude practice. I love that. Also love therapy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and part of that gratitude practice is that before we go on stage, my band and I, we try to focus on 
all of the shows and all the decisions that brought us to where we are in that moment. So the practice of honoring exactly what you're talking about and saying, you know, last time we were in Chicago, we played the 500 cap and the time before we played a 250 and now we're here at Aragon and really trying to bring that forward and think about that and hold that in your heart because, um, yeah, I don't know, our, the line of your expectation shifts so quickly, right, as you succeed in your life changes. And, um, so, it, yeah, it feels absolutely surreal. And, it, you know, it's, it's um, not something I ever thought I'd do. When my album came out, I thought I was going to tour for two weeks, you know, another album, and that ended up being almost two years. And then um, a handful of support tours. So I've been able to pretty much see all of America and play in most of the major markets and secondary markets here. And um, yeah, it's so beyond what, what I expected. So um, yeah, trying to hold some active gratitude. That's awesome. I mean, it's definitely hard to stay grounded, I'm sure, because like you grew up kind of in the New York area playing probably like grimy basements and- Totally. You know, um, I want to shift into, I actually discovered your music by a little known like Spotify playlist called the Feel Good Indie Rock Playlist. I don't know if you know much about the Spotify Indie Rock Playlist, but like that is my, that is my actual like entire music taste is this playlist. <laughs> and I think they honestly steal my music. Like I think they like somehow hacked into my Spotify and I'm like, what is this girl listening to and add it to it? Um, but I swear I- Like Kristen Maroney and- <laughs> Yes, lovers, and all that stuff. lovers, yeah. coin, all of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're in there, but you're always at the top. Like, might I add, like, you are literally, oh, two, you're like, that one is always at the top. And I'm so proud. Um, but yeah, how do you think indie music has shifted in the past few years? And specifically with um, kind of these playlists and Spotify and the algorithms promoting you guys' music and music that might not have been, um, you know, there if we were in a different time. Yeah, I mean, God, I mean, everything is changing every year in the music industry. It's, it's an insane time to be doing this. The technology is changing every year. What people want is changing. The rapidness with which, as a creator, you need to put out music is changing. You know, TikTok has obviously completely, completely changed the music industry. Um, I feel really fortunate that I had been putting out music for a number of years. I really feel for new artists, like really new artists who are just putting out their first releases right now on Spotify, because I think unless you have a real like gatekeeper on your side, like a big major label or a big manager, I think it's really hard to crack, just to like crack that system. I know that the people at Spotify really do champion unknown artists and yeah. I'm they're, they are to thank for so much of what I've been able to do from with my career, but also there's just so much music coming out, regardless of how thoughtful they are and good at research they are. There's just, you know, it's, it's something like, I, I don't remember the exact number, but it's something like 100,000 new songs a week is coming out. Um, That's crazy. But creatively, I think there's obviously probably a lot of trash in there, but I think there's probably a lot of really brilliant stuff too. And I think the technology and this sort of leveling of the playing field means that like anyone who has some money can buy a, you know, a recording set up and make a song, which is insane. Sure. No, actually, $200, let me buy this piano. <laughs> and I mean, can I play it? Not well. But Maybe. And that's how I got into music. You know, I like was bad at sports and <laughs> there was like a, an interface and a microphone in a closet at my high school. And I started recording and, and um, you know, I think like indie music in particular, to answer your question more directly, I think that I think that it's a really good time for indie music because I think that people, I have seen a lot of younger artists who can take their careers really far without a label. Yeah. Um, I've always been, it had at least one foot in the label system, you know, mostly indie labels, but um uh, you know, a lot of the artists that I've become friends with and toured with, like, like New Girl in Red or Gus mm -hmm. Dapper, um, I think, well, I think Dago is similarly, like, yeah, I've 
been able to take their music really far without signing to a label. You know, I think a couple of those artists maybe have just signed to labels, but. Yeah, I was about to say, I was like, I didn't realize Dave Lowe wasn't on a label. That's very impressive. He now, but I think he, he definitely at least started, you know, independently. And, yeah. uh, and there's so many examples. And I think that it's good for artistry because I think that if you can build a real fan base before signing to a label, you can get a tremendous amount of leverage, you know, and that means that you just have a more favorable situation and actually own your music and, and get more resources. And um, yeah, so I think for that reason, it's really exciting, but it's complicated, you know, it's a complicated time for music. I think a lot of people have, take a lot of issue with, um, if it at the algorithmic turn, you know, of mm -hmm. just what we get served and how there's less human curation and less attention to detail but I I'm I'm sort of undecided on all that I you know I have my records that I love and I love finding new music um yeah but yeah no, I agree I, I mean like five years we'll see, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> how it's shifted okay I will I'll keep that in mind okay another question on I guess shifting how do you think live music has shifted in recent years um because I saw Maggie put on her TikTok about just the huge crowds and like a lot of people have been passing out but not even in the, in the unsafe regard. Um, just how do you think kind of fans and live music have really shifted since COVID specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I was personally really afraid that I would never get to tour because I was just about to start touring when COVID started. And then obviously, you know, there was a good two years where there was, it was completely illegal to play a show. And I think yeah. the greatest fear was that, you know, people would never want to go to shows again, you know, that, it would be replaced by all the other experiential um, opportunities we have now, you know. But um, I think coming out of COVID and going right into touring, I mean, I played one of the first shows back at Red Rocks. And then when oh, my- Oh yeah, with Mount Joy. That's yeah, awesome. And then when my tour started, like our tour was one of the first like international tours that was hitting a lot of places and that was only just because of the timing of it we like got in really early and yeah. um contrary to my fears I mean I I really feel like I came out into a world that was especially hungry for connection and especially hungry for live music um I mean it, it was wild I, I think I think I think there was you know even a bit of a bubble you know I mean touring came back so strong right after and right tours were blowing out all over the world I mean my tour pretty much completely sold out in like two weeks um Congrats. that's awesome and thank you and um so I I think this is all to say like the the, the proof is in the pudding a bit that like I think we really need that connection that in-person connection and I think that people really want to be in a room with other people and feel that energy and connect with an artist they love and hear music like moving the air so yeah. I think that's been, you know, incredibly reaffirming. I think the, the the other side of it is that, yeah, I mean, people are like more conscious of being in crowds and touching each other, and and, and that's all, that's all good. And I I think the responsibility just falls more on, you know, the artists and the promoters and the venues to try to like educate people and give people the resources and make sure people stay safe. No, definitely well spoken there. Um, I agree. I'm I'm a concert junkie. Like if I I, I could not know any of your songs and I will go like I just love live music so in my own like as a fan I've definitely seen the shift in crowd and just the hunger like um like especially buying tickets that's been the real struggle for fans is like tickets will sell out within like an hour now so you really have yeah. to be on top of your game of like artists you love and want to see because um the resale market's horrible too so it's just yeah. really tough yeah. I think for for fans in the in the the boom after COVID. Um, but it's great to be able to like, I mean, as you, you're a musician, be able to like sell out shows and it's it's just huge. Yeah, I mean it is. And 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 to your point about the demand, I mean, you know, we're obviously in like a, a bit of a, a moment with Ticketmaster and trying to figure out how we all feel about that. Because because I mean right. the, the other side of touring, which I mean, you know, pe people may or may not know about it, is just how hard it is right now as an artist to 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 make money and survive touring you know even if you're touring at basically the highest level and you know selling out five to seven thousand capacity rooms like just the nature of inflation and covid and fuel prices and all this stuff has 
most people that I know that are operating at that level are either breaking even or losing money. And it's, um, that's horrible. The economy as well as just, you know, the way that the trickle down works with, um, yeah, with ticket sales, it's, it's hard to actually get that money out of people's hands and into your pockets, which is a misconception. You know, I think a lot of fans like think that when they're buying a ticket, um, the shit, you know, a large share of that is, is ending up with the musician, which it often isn't, but yeah. um, God, I, no. I think we're like smart as an industry. And I think that we're going to figure out a way to make sure everyone feels taken care of. Um, I agree. I think, I think to take a master will have its karma. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's, that's my hope. Okay. Well, moving, you know, on along, what is your rehearsal process? I know you guys talked about gratitude and really enforcing that kind of what is your going on stage prep like what songs do you really want to rehearse and perfect before you go on stage what what is that kind of mindset before you get on there yeah so we we do we do a few weeks of rehearsal before we go out um in LA which is fun because a lot of it is the moments when I feel like I'm in a band you know we get to work on the songs together and be creative and it's a lot of just like long days of sitting in a rehearsal studio and working out the details which as a musician is really fun I mean that's like the best part is sort of getting to nerd out on gear and music and decisions and um you know and the hope is that by the time you get to the tour like you don't have to think I mean that's like the goal I mean it's the same as you know being a professional athlete or performer or anything like the goal is to be so is to have the muscle memory so tight that you can just be open and free and turn your brain off and, you know, perform and the rest will be taken care of. And so a lot of the process of rehearsing and getting ready for the show is doing things to just reinforce that flow state, being able to get to that flow state. So a lot of that is, yeah, just running the songs, you know, tens of times and then, um, you know, really connecting as a group. We do a lot of breathing together. We do a lot of meditation together. We, um, we, we spend time sort of actively connecting, you know, like prolonged eye contact and, um, oh, being, really? yeah, you know, being able to share, uh, you know, a goal for the set or a goal for the, yeah. the tour or, um, you know, and I think as like the leader of the group, it's sort of, it's, it's become my, uh, my my duty to just make sure that we are connected in that way and, and make sure everyone's on the same page because you know uh if you're not a unit I think it really comes out in the music yeah okay well speaking of kind of just being tight and really having all of your things together what do you think is your kind of band you look up to that is just like absolutely kills it live hmm. um it's a great question I mean, I had the fortune of going to so many festivals this year because, you know, I'd play and then I would just stay the whole weekend. Oh, so um, you do end up staying the weekend? I'm always curious. I'm like, I would I mean, love I to. A lot of people them. don't. I, was, <laughs> I love the Marias. I think they're so cool. The Marias are great. They're, they're like a real unit and they're like, a re- I think, I think there aren't many real bands left, you know, because yeah. my band's a solo project that, you know, I hire people to play with me. And I think they're a good example of, a band that is really a unit and they make the records together and feels really cohesive and um, yeah their visual world I mean, their their clothing is always really on point and um love clothing yeah That's awesome. so I've loved seeing them play um I saw idols a few times oh, it's, um, a few amazing. I mean they're, they're just like a you know a very different example in the marinas but they're just like they feel so like old school it's just like they're it's like and raw yep what you see is what you get and um <laughs> a bit older and I think turnstile similarly they're, they're another yes refreshing. they're just like they're doing their thing and uh and have sort of quietly become this like huge part of culture and I really respect that those are all amazing bands I concur um I've seen you played a couple of covers while you have been on tour um maybe one of complicated which is like one of my all-time favorite Avril songs mm-hmm. so what is one song that you wish you wrote so you could play it on tour all the time wow that's a good question um song I wish I wrote 
I mean, one of my favorite songs of all time is Killer by Phoebe Bridgers. I just think the writing is killer, is a song that I wish I wrote. Yeah. I, this sort of sad, dark comedy of it is really brilliant. And some, that, that feeling is something I've really tried to attain in my writing, and I don't think I've been able to touch it in the way that she has in that song in particular. Um, this sort of character writing and the... Yeah. No, I think, I think you accomplished it. Some no, some dark so comedy. I just love I I I really am a sucker for that that dark comedy in music, and I think there's a really fine line of being able to do that in a way that feels very convincing. And I think she's really good at that. And I think there's a few other artists that come to mind, like Harry Nilsson and mm -hmm. Misty. John Lennon's really good at that. Um, yep. Classics. Yeah. Amazing. Those are all great answers. Um, okay, I have to bring this up because I'm obsessed with her. But Florence Pugh, obviously, recently in an interview said that they couldn't clear your songs. Um, it was a Vogue interview. Did Vogue actually reach out? And is why was why couldn't they clear your songs for the Vogue interview? I've been told since we couldn't clear Del Water Gap that we're gonna listen to some stock music. So she actually reached out to me a few months beforehand and gave me a little context, and I completely forgot about it. No. <laughs> basically what happened like Florence has been uh, such a, a a supporter of my music and um I mean I've said this before but I think the greatest compliment as an artist is having an artist that you respect affirming your work she's been like a really positive force in my life and we've become friendly and she reached out to me and said you know I, I did this Vogue interview and I asked them if we could get your music for it and they said that they're not going to cl clear any music at all that they were just going to be stopped yeah so it wasn't really an issue of my music in particular it was just a, you know they just I, I guess just didn't have a budget or whatever so yeah. they never actually reached out but she she told me she said hey I did this interview and the way that I worded it people might think that you turned turned Vogue down and just so you know like, I'm they, glad to clear the air then they weren't going to clear anything, but um, I gave you a shout out and um, and that's that. So yeah, she told me and I sort of laughed it off and forgot about it. And then, you know, I woke up and my Instagram was like completely blown up. up and broken. So, and then the funniest part was my, uh, my, my lawyer, he's on Instagram. He commented on the video, like, what was the clearance issue? <laughs> it's like, Stop. Bro, I think we're a little late. <laughs> That is so funny. Um, that's amazing. I love that she's been a huge supporter of you. I love um, I love her as just a human being. She's amazing and hilarious. Um, I have to ask though, what is your favorite Florence Pugh movie then? I just saw this film. Um, God, I'm not gonna remember the name, but oh, what was it called? She plays a she plays a nurse who is trying oh, to- Oh, yeah, The Wonder. Yes, The Wonder. I really liked it. I sort of I like it too. saw it passively and accidentally, but I just loved the mood of it. I thought it was so beautiful. Yeah. You know, it was so dark and dour. And I think the time when I saw it, I was spending a lot of time indoors working on my album. And sometimes when I'm working on music, I like to just put on a movie in the background. And mm -hmm. I really liked that movie. And um, I liked the yeah, mood of it too. Uh, she's, she's, she's so brilliant. Um, in Little Women, I, I really think she's like the standout in that film. And, mm -hmm. uh, she I, made me realize that I was an Amy. I was like, I really always thought I was a Joe, but no. <laughs> I'm sadly an Amy, but she killed it. Though. Yeah, she's a shit. I still haven't seen Midsummer, but I, I need to at some point. Oh my God. Well, you have to mentally prepare yourself. Honestly, I think you would love it. From what you're saying about dark comedy, just in general, it's dark. I don't know if the comedy is there, but. <laughs> It's good. I think she was when she reached out, but um, you know, she's obviously become like a really important part of our, our world and our culture. Oh, uh -huh. and I also saw she follows you on Instagram, which is just huge. I wish she followed me on Instagram <laughs> and saw my story. Oh yeah, let me know. Yeah, talk to her, talk to her people, talk to my people. Um, last couple of questions here. Um, I know you said you've traveled a ton now with touring, but is this going to be your first time I'm assuming not in Arizona for the M3F festival. In Arizona, no. I played, I played a festival called Innings Festival in Tampa, um, 
which I believe was my first time in Arizona. That was a great festival. It was one of the last times Taylor Hawkins played with Foo Fighters before he died, which was That's you know, monumental. Was really sad, but it was I feel really cool to have been able to um see them play that night. I mean that that that's sort of the standout memory of that night. Um we played in Phoenix a couple times. Mm-hmm. It was really hot. We actually had a great show in Phoenix. I wish I remembered the name of the venue, but it was it was like 110 degrees outside. And my van started melting and we had to bring it inside. No. Um, oh my God. I'm definitely glad the festival is in March. Seems yeah. like a good time of year for Phoenix. Um, yeah. well, that's awesome. I love, I love that you stay for festivals. I was about to ask, is there any other artists on the lineup for this festival that you're like really excited to to watch their set. Let me see. I gotta re- refresh. Um, I can name the top a couple. Yeah, name the there's top. a good amount of like EDM, like Purple Disco Machine, um, and then there's like some smaller ones like Ash Coin. Yeah. yeah. That's all on Friday. Friday's set list is amazing. Like I, I want to see everyone, but I cannot. Just look at this. Yeah. Okay. Channel Trace. I love Channel Trace. Mm-hmm. Channel and I became friends um, in Morocco. We, we did some work with Saint Laurent together and I'm such a fan of his music and he's the sweetest guy. So I'm really excited to see him. Oh, that's awesome. Child, do you know Child? Yes. Sir. I mean, his song Pirouette was one of my top songs of the year last year. Oh my God, amazing. He's great. Let's see who else is on here. Jamie XX. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. He has a new album, I'm so excited. See who else? Yes, yeah, it's a cool festival. I mean, there's a lot of it's friends, crazy. friends with with ninety two and Chelsea Cutler and mm-hmm. a coin. I really like those guys. Yeah. yeah, it's like a really cool festival. Obviously, Maggie's playing. It's a lot of things. Exactly. Um, it's also all going to charity. So, is there any any charities you want to shout out? Yeah, I mean, I have. Um, been fortunate enough to work with Oxfam America a bunch. Um, they're they're just like an awesome, like a little bit under the radar charity. Um, I met Bob Ferguson who who um, he works there. Um, I don't know exactly his position, but I met him when I was twelve or thirteen. He was like an early music mentor of mine, and he. From the beginning, you know, he really talked to me and my my little band at the time about how musicians, uh, we have a real duty to use our platforms to uh, to help elevate. You know, that's awesome. That's definitely that's awesome. great advice. So I met Bob and you know, when I was a kid. You know, I was playing to like ten people that were all my parents' friends. Um, so him, him getting that in my ear early on was really powerful, and it's been it's been cool. You know decades later to be working with him you know Alex has been able to come to a couple of my shows and set up mm-hmm. and we've been able to work together a bit on um online so I love them they do really great work you know they help they mainly do like food outreach and, and get people fed um so they've been working a lot in Syria and you know trying to get food to the people over there that's awesome oh well thank you for shouting them out I'll definitely have yeah. to take a look um, I know we are about time, but I do have a couple of rapid fire if you have a few minutes. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Um, first off, most fun city you've toured so far? Amsterdam. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, because we did a bunch of drugs. We just had the best show there and it was so beautiful and I met the best people. What stadium were, or where were you guys playing at in Amsterdam? We played at Melkweg in Amsterdam. It was, yeah, it was the best day. We had the best food and yeah, I'll never forget it. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay. What is the first thing that you do in a new city? Like you, you know, hop off the tour bus and like, what is the first thing you do? Find a coffee shop. A lot yeah. of foreign people are coffee snobs. They'll tell you, because I think one of the constants is in America is that you can find like a good coffee shop pretty much anywhere and it, it, it can really ground you. Yeah. What's uh what's your go-to order? I really just, what I call the beer shot combo is <laughs> amazing. A drip coffee and an espresso. Because I think yeah. like I'm I'm sort of a basic guy in the sense that I love a drip coffee, but I think an espresso is the best 
testament of how good the coffee shop is. So if the coffee shop has a great espresso, they know what they're doing. That's funny. My, my I would call my like other personality is Latte Lexi because I used to work at Starbucks back in college. So I love that. They call that a red eye, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the more you know. Them, I mean, that's like, woo. yeah. <laughs> woo. <laughs> yeah, make your own cold brew with warm. Um, okay, what would be your like dream festival headliner um, for M3F or really any festival that you would be playing at? Uh, like an artist. That you would want Yeah. Um, yeah. My dream festival headliner. I mean, I guess this is supposed to be rapid fire. So I'm just going to say Bjork. Yep. Bjork. And she's been like such a constant in my life. And I've seen her play at a few festivals. And she's crazy. I I literally crazy. love her. Yeah. I mean, I saw her go ball and she brought like a 30 piece orchestra. So I, I think Bjork for sure. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, I guess that was really it. I didn't really have that many. Um, last thing though is what would be, the, what is your first thing that you used to teach the old ladies on Photoshop? I heard you used to have a little bit of an odd job background, but I, I dabble in Photoshop. So what was like your first <laughs> skill you would teach them? Uh, copy and paste. I mean, it's <laughs> That's... a very commonly <laughs> overlooked skill that is useful across pretty much all of technology. Use it for email, yeah. texting, so wow. teaching, teaching the old ladies how to copy and paste was big, very big. That is very helpful. Uh, the more you know. <laughs> um, cool. Well, that's actually really all the questions I had. I did have like a little follow-up one was just like how your grandma affected your relationship with music, but I know we're kind of out of time. No, I mean, I can answer that. Yeah, my my grandma, I, can, I come from a family of mainly very unartistic academics. You know, my my brother's a lawyer and my cousins are astrophysicists and um, they're all brilliant, but not particularly creative. And my, my grandma was the other artist in the family always. She's a filmmaker. So mm -hmm. she, um, she has been, you know, one of the, one of the real allies for me. She, uh, she's a harsh critic. I've showed her my albums and she's, I showed her my first album, you know, a week before it came out and she told me I had to start over, which is... You're she did not. Did you start over? No, of course not. <laughs> she said, you know, I just can't understand the lyrics. And if you can't understand the lyrics, then no one's gonna listen to it. And then she came to she came to my Webster Hall show in New York and you know it was sold out and all these people were singing along and she took it back. She said I was wrong. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. Cause she's like 97, 98, right? Like yeah, she's 98, yeah. She's kicking it. Do you guys still do um your movies, your weekly movies? Yeah. We do film club every week, yeah. We just watched, um, what was it? What did we just watch? We just watched, I have a little list here. All Quiet in the Western Front. Classic. <laughs> did you like it? What were your thoughts? Yeah, it's sad. It's sad. Do you letterbox it? I, I, I don't have letterbox. I just have this sort of extensive note <laughs> here. Classic. Um, this has been amazing. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. I know, obviously, with your crazy schedule of touring and stuff, um, but I will be at M3F, so if you Great. want to shout me out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll see you there. See you yeah, there. see me there. Let's hang out. Um, we can get a drink. We'll take a shot. I don't know. Let's Go. Do it all. Uh, but yeah, thank you again. This has been me, awesome. Yeah, thanks for the chat. I appreciate it. Well, have a good day and have a, I don't know if you're playing tonight, but have a great yeah. rest of your tour. Thank Ooh. you. Bye.